All right, we are live and welcome to the Whitlam Organics Weekly Garden Report and live Q&A. Got a great show today um, about uh, an organization that I'm super excited about, um, the Florida Farm Finder. Um, kind of swooped right in right when this uh, pandemic was heading and uh, things were getting harder to find at the grocery stores, kind of just the perfect storm, perfect timing. But before we meet Jillian, the uh, founder of the Florida Farm Finder, I want to get into our weekly nursery and garden report. So lots to talk about, lots to report. So I think I mentioned last week that we had planted charred collards, kale, broccoli, beans, uh, another plant called Mizuna. Well, that's all up. Um, we're actually up planting it right now um, into four packs, and it should be ready for sale here in just a couple weeks. Um, just to kind of fill everybody in, if you're new to this, uh, basically I give a nursery report and a garden report, what we have going on in our nursery, what we're planting, what we're doing with it, um, as well as what I'm doing and seeing when I'm going to gardens around the Tampa Bay area in hopes that this will help you as a home gardener kind of know what, where you should be at in the, se in the season. Um, we were a little early on planting uh, some of these greens, um, but I was taking a chance that the weather would kind of turn um, and not be so hot a little bit on the earlier side. Usually here in Central Florida, the weather takes a turn. Uh, I'm not gonna say cools off, but um, becomes not miserable anymore. Um, somewhere between the last week of September and the first week of November, averaging right around the second week of October. Well, folks, I was right. I don't know if any of you have been paying attention to the two-week forecast. If you have not, I, I, I look at it on my weather app. I, I only think on the news that they're five days out. But check out the two-week forecast, you guys. Um, I believe the first day of fall, well, the day before, two days before on the 20th, we start going down a little bit for morning temperatures. Um, the day before the first day of fall, I believe the morning temperature is like 71, 72. And then right after that, we're actually supposed to see some high 60s for morning temperatures. Daytime highs, which I'm not as concerned about, um, are bumping around mid to low 80s. So first day of fall, we're actually getting fall weather. Yay! What does that mean? It means that if you uh, want to go ahead and get some of those heat tolerant winter vegetables planted now, it's not too early. I believe I had mentioned that I was waiting and holding off a little bit on planting my tomatoes out into uh, my gardens. Um, I'm doing it. I'm going to put those out this week. Um, last week, uh, we transplanted pepper plants out into our garden beds. The week and two weeks before that, we had transplanted eggplants, which tend to be a little more heat tolerant, out into our garden bed. So if you have those starts, um, uh, transplants of tomato plants, it is definitely not too early to get those out in the garden. And in fact, if we would have gotten them out there four weeks ago and they were medium-sized plants pushing out flowers already, um, we, we've got that perfect weather for them right around the corner, upper 60s, low 80, uh, nighttime temperature in the upper 60s. Um, daytime highs in the mid to lower 80s is perfect tomato weather. And, um, you know, will it warm back up? I don't know, but um, I'm rolling the dice. Things are looking really good and I'm super excited. So um, we have out in our nursery um, also planted some beans. Um, we just planted them up into four packs uh, and they're doing really well. And with this weather cool off, I'm actually going to go ahead and start planting beans seeds out in my gardens uh this week i mean obviously i'm not talking about like cow peas uh and uh yard long beans i'm talking about real beans fall beans uh bush beans tender green bush beans uh blue lake fall beans um whatever your whatever your poison is go ahead and get those beans started right away i, I really don't think it's too early um we've also been straight seeding squash and cucumbers um melons if you're going to try melons or or corn um it's you really want to get that stuff started uh right away um they take a little bit longer um and they what i found is the weather's good for them but as we round the corner into the shorter days of 
the end of November into December, they're not too happy. So if you're going to try some of that stuff that is typically reserved for spring crops, you really want to get on the ball and get that stuff planted. Um, potatoes, if you want to give them a shot, I usually don't do as well with my fall potatoes as I do with my spring potatoes, but I usually do get a crop. So if you don't mind harvesting them in 60 to 85 days, just as little new potatoes, you can probably get some potatoes uh, going right now. Out in the nursery, we, we also started planting seeds of some of our more heat tolerant lettuces. This is, I'll tell you what guys, this is just an exciting time for planting everything right now. Um, but for those of you who've been kind of following along, it's not something you get out there and just plant all at once for your fall garden. We started our tomatoes way back at the end of July, and we've just kind of been planting by seed stuff, um, you know, about every week as we've been getting closer and closer to fall. And uh, planting seeds out in your gardens or transplanting your transplants out in your gardens kind of goes uh, along along the same path. Um, if you just kind of you know start the longer stuff early by seed and then start planting that stuff out in your garden as we get closer to fall. The stuff that's a shorter season crop or comes up really quick, you can uh, wait a little while and put that stuff out in your garden. So in other words, we put our tomato seeds in the uh, nursery um, at the end of July, and then we just put our squash seeds in the ground um, about two weeks ago, um, and it's not too late. Again, we're always playing um, this gamble on the earlier side. Um, so uh, the lettuces that we are starting right now is Jericho Romaine from Israel. Um, probably have a little bit of problems with the germination temperatures, on, uh, with germination rates on it right now with the temperatures a little bit high. You should still get some. Um, if you're a little bit worried about some of your lettuces, you can start them indoors or put them in the fridge for three days before putting them out. So in other words, plant your lettuce seeds in the soil, wet it, stick it in the fridge for a few days, take it out, and then and then put it out. That would usually kind of trick them into germination. I doubt many of you actually have a dedicated refrigerator that you can, uh, with lights in it, that you can actually plant your uh, lettuces and just leave them in there. Um, that makes things a little bit tricky. Um, so again, yeah, eggplants went out into the gardens about three or four weeks ago. Peppers, we started transplanting out into the gardens a week or two ago and up through this week. Um, and then uh, as soon as I get out there in the gardens, I'm going to be putting in uh, tomato plants, transplanting tomato plants. Problems I've been seeing, um, a little bit in our nursery, but a lot out in other gardens. White fly seems to be really um, kicking up right now. So keep an eye out, white flies. Um, you'll typically see them with like little bit of gnats flying around. If you look up the undersides of your leaves, especially on peppers right now, um, you'll see the white fly. Um, some horticulture soap <laughs> is a good treatment for that. Um, but in addition, I actually pick off the leaves that have the, uh, the white stuff on the bottom of them and just destroy those leaves and then feed my plants a little bit of extra nutrients so they can push out some uh, new leaves. So that coupled with uh, the horticulture spray, if you can, if you happen to have them in pots or it's accessible, I know this isn't the best um, solution, but if you can, the uh, hands down best organic solution I've ever found for white flies to stick a fan on the plants. I, I mean, I know that's not practical if your garden's way out there in the yard, but if say you're growing in your uh, lanai or close to your house and you can put a fan on the plants because the adult white flies are terrible flyers and they just won't even be able to land on your plants. So that's about wraps up our weekly garden report. Um, also, just to give everybody a heads up on the format, I give a, a report in the beginning. Today, we have an interview with Jillian from the Florida Farmer, uh, Florida Farm Finder. And um, then at the end, we'll take questions. If you guys have any questions for myself about gardening or Jillian about the uh, Florida Farm Finder, please uh, send them in the uh, comments. We can both see them and we'll get to them at the end. So without further ado, and listening to me ramble on, I'm gonna bring Jillian in and uh, we're gonna chit chat about this great new uh, organization that she's starting on. Hey, Jillian. Hi, David. How you doing? 
I'm doing great. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is awesome. So um, you're very welcome. Thanks for joining me. Um, why don't you start off uh, basically tell everybody a little bit about what Florida Farm Finder is just really briefly. Um, but what I want you to really get into in the beginning is how did it start? <laughs> Where were you at? Because, because, oh, yeah, man. Well, yeah. it was, uh, I think it was May and I was buried in, you know, uh, anxiety and struggling to find some sort of purpose in the midst of the coronavirus beginnings. And um, I, you know, my husband wanted me to get off the news channels and stop, you know, posting <laughs> random stuff on Facebook. And I needed to find something to do with my time. And um, the surplus crops had just started. You just started seeing all those viral images of squash and stuff being yeah. turned into the soil and destroyed and just absolutely heartbreaking to see that. And um, I, you know, I have a lot of farm friends in the area and my friends were starting to tap into that market a little bit. Um, some of them had opened their own produce stands. Some of them had done roadside stands. Some of them had teamed up with other farmers to expand their network a little bit. And uh, my good friend Lindsay up at Backwoods in Groveland kind of inspired me to say, hey, you know, all of these farmers are out there, but they don't really have time to get their content out to the people. You know, when you spend your days planting and digging in the sun, and this, you, the last thing you want to do is go on Facebook at the end of the day and say, oh, hey, by the way, our lettuce is ready. So right. in order to get that content out to the people, I just created the Facebook group and started filling it with all of the posts I could find, tagging everyone by county. And now we have upwards of, I think, 20,000 different posts that you can search through. Yeah, wow. <laughs> I average about 200 to 300 a week. So um, some of them are new farms, some of them are older. Um, but yeah, it's it's all completely searchable. You can join our Facebook group. It's Florida Farm Finder. Um, it's also known as kind of a big deal because we think small farms are kind of a big deal. And you can join our group. You can search for all of the content that I have. You can search by county. You can actually, you can probably search by town now. We have so much stuff that... There's probably enough detail there. You can search by product. We even have our own hashtags. Um, okay. if, you, if you want to uh, look for milk, you can check out our hashtag FL Moo Juice, you know, Florida Moo Juice. So it's, it's been a labor of love, but we are four months into it now, and we just crossed over 6,500 members today, just wow. a couple of minutes ago. So, yeah, it's, it's huge. <laughs> hey, yeah. um. It, how many of those are, are like, do you have a kind of a clue how many of those are farms versus how many people are looking for farmers or farms? So in the beginning, it was a very heavy consumer, very heavy <laughs> buyers, people looking for farms and events and UPICs because we started right at the height of the UPIC season. You know, it was blueberries, strawberries, the end of strawberries, uh, the beginning of blueberry season. So right. we, um, at that point, it was still very, you know, uh, Lots of consumers, not very many answers. People were asking, where is all this stuff? And I'm like, I don't know yet, but I'll find out. <laughs> um, and then as we've developed and as I've started to learn more about the individual farms, I've friended a lot of the farmers. I've friended a lot of the market owners. Um, and now it's getting to the point where I would say we're probably about 15% producer and then about 85% consumer. Okay. that's Those are, those are good numbers. Um, yes. What kind of feedback are you getting from, let's do the farmers first. What kind of feedback are you getting from the farmers? Is it working? Um, oh, they, oh. Yeah. yes. I, I mean, I would say it was working and I know a couple of them would definitely say it's working. Um, uh -huh. I've had people who have never sold farming goods on Facebook before and never sold, you know, their beef or the stuff that they've been selling at their markets locally um, and jumping into our group and selling out you know, in just a couple of weeks. So yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. It really is. The impact is amazing because people are looking for it. And uh, with the little bit of food scarcity that we had, you know, just a little snap of food scarcity kind sure. of made everybody rethink what's going on. I'm sure you're experiencing that with all the COVID gardening and yeah. it's, yeah. it's the, the market is there. It's just the farmers are thrilled and they're also able to inter network 
So, um, you know, a market who may have not been able to offer beef or chicken a few months ago now has all these resources available to them. They can just say, hey, you have beef. I have a market that needs beef. Can we hook it up? Can we figure it out? You know, how can we bring your product into my market? Uh, it's it's great. It's, it's huge. <laughs> so this is almost like a, um, a self-run distribution of of food what am i trying to say like it's a um almost like blockchain of food a little like bit it's, yeah. It's, yeah i mean it's, i love i love the what i like to tell people is i love the free market so much that i created uh -huh. my own <laughs> okay. that's, awesome. that's really amazing and then so what's your feedback from the consumers are they finding everything that they need is there still a huge place for farmers to sign up and um and and move their goods i mean do you, like is there a wall and do you see it coming or are we still so far away from that um that it's just not even conceivable you know i it, i keep wondering when the other shoe will drop and when everybody will go back to walmart but i just i don't see that happening i really don't people are very serious about turning toward a more sustainable lifestyle and it's, it's very exciting um but from a consumer point of view the biggest feedback I get is, oh my gosh, I didn't even know that was there. I've lived in this county for 10 years and I didn't know there was a farm 10 minutes. Talking from about me. the farms. Okay. Yeah. So they yeah. didn't even know yeah. the so, right there. Right, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The consumers are coming to me. The buyers are coming to me. People who have never been stepped foot on a farm before in their life. This is amazing. You know, we have access to all these goods now. It's it's been very encouraging. Very encouraging. Um, do you see a place um, for, uh, I've always said this, like one of the double-edged swords in our food system are the food distributors. Like they can, um, they can, it, it's, there's a, there's a place for them um, because they are that connection point. Um, so if, if it's a legit company uh, with good ethics, but it's also the place for the most corruption um, because they kind of have their hands on both sides of the dollars and cents. I agree. Um, you know, and, and um, I know that they, for example, big food distributors hold some of our state's biggest uh, food contracts for school lunches. And when mm -hmm. the state started trying to push for the fresh from Florida um, initiative, they got a lot of pushback from some of those larger um, food distributors because they were kind of the only only person and only game in town for a long time and they wanted to have the wiggle room to get the cheaper produce from outside the state and from outside the country because their contracts you know had a, a static price point on this side and so on this side you can't see my hand and then so on this side it had more wiggle room for them to profit for right um, and so, you know, the food distributors, you know, turn around and tell the the grocery store or the end consumer or the market manager what the price is, like what they're going to sell it for. And right. they're also the ones who tell the farmers what they're going to buy it for. And the farmers don't tell the food distributors what the price is, the food right. distributors. So they're kind of setting the market as far as how much the food costs. And, you know, when there's disruptions in our food system, it's really weird. This might get my tinfoil hat out. Um, and people start talking about the issues in our food systems. Um, they talk about the farmers, ah, farmers destroying food. And then they talk about the grocery stores, ah, overcharging, undercharging the farm workers. Nobody talks about the food distributors who are right there in the middle of the whole thing. So somehow they've stayed hidden. Um, but it's like the most important part of uh, a co the most important cog in the wheel. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I feel like this is kind of filling that gap. Um, well, you know, we're cutting getting, them out. <laughs> it's, cutting, it's cutting them out, but almost to, I'm wondering if at some point it would be time to let them back in. Um, in other words, like not any of them, but maybe another food distributor who's, you know, say a nonprofit and, um, you know, is just going to, they're going to pay their, they're going to pay their workers a, a fair wage. They're mm -hmm. going to pay their truck drivers well. They're going to pay for the gas. They're going to pay for their computer software that they need to manage all the little bleeps and bloops. Mm -hmm. And they're going to pay themselves as the owner a decent salary, you know. Um, that's all fine. But basically then the food cost, almost other than that stuff, becomes a straight through cost 
from what it takes for the farmer to produce them, uh, go through distrib distribution and then to the grocer. Um, so I, I, um, I mean, I just, I know how distribution works and how it can be um, a really, really good thing because um, you can, you know, do pre-buys from your farmers. Right. Um, the farmers don't have to leave the farm. Um, they, you know, can sell it all at once. And then the dis the distributors worry about where, where it's all going. But like I said, I think, I feel like that's the place in our food system that we've really been let down. I definitely think there's a hole there. Um, but again, I think that's more like medium sized farms, maybe and a little bit more toward the larger ones. Most, the majority of what we have in our group is, you know, a, a handful of acres, small gardens, um, permaculture methods, polyculture methods. Uh, the bigger ones, of course, ranchers, they've got way more acres, that sort of thing. But it's uh, for us, I think a lot of the pleasure that we get out of this is going directly to the source. Okay. You know, I'm cutting out all of that completely and, you know, connecting with the farmer, connecting with the grower. Um, uh -huh. you know, it's not just, hey, I have this beef for sale. It's, hey, I have this beef for sale. And here's an adorable picture of my daughter who's going to, you know, ballet school. And that's why I'm selling my beef. You know, it's not about I need to make X amount of dollars for overhead. I need to do this. I need to do that. It's it's more about re connecting the suburbs and you know those uh, food desert areas with their local uh, as small as possible farms produce markets uh, small goods stores local boutiques that bring in those sorts of vendors um, and all the shops that support those farms so you know when we talk about distribution and access to it, we are trying to bring it down to as local as possible. I don't want you to have to go to Publix if you don't have to, because there's a farm right down there who can give you stuff that was pulled out of the ground this morning, rather than putting it on a truck, rather than putting it in a storage facility, rather than trying to keep it cool with refrigeration that you have to pay for. Skip all of that, go right to the farm. That's, basically That's amazing. So you answered my question. So we are, we, you are like legitimately trying to skip the distributor step yes. and get rid of it. That's, yes. that's awesome. That answers my question. Yep. And I think that there's a, um, yeah, there's a huge place for that. I know that one of the biggest issues that small farms have is getting their food to the people. Yes. That's where I come in. <laughs> I, I always thought, you know, just trying to gather all that information and making it available to a, a larger group, you know, you can search on Facebook for small farms and, and the state really did a great job earlier in the pandemic era of gathering as much detail as they could. I know the Florida Farm Bureau did a great job with their list and they put together those spreadsheets and they, they tried to push all those local options out there, um, but it's not very personal. And it also concerned me that they were giving addresses and information, but not really any hours of opening, no seasonal information. You know, you can go pick berries at this farm, but I don't think they're going to want you to show up at five o'clock and they may not want to answer the phone at 730 when you call. So when you connect directly on, you know, in an effort like a social media, um, it's, it's a little bit more personal. You get to know, you know, exactly you, you see the sprout from tiny little seed all the way up to giant plant that you can buy the next day in the market, you know, and that's, that's really important to me because you can see what they grow, how they grow, when they grow, uh, you, you know exactly what kind of access you have, you know, whether that farm is by appointment or whether they're open Monday through Friday, eight to five, you know, it gives you a little bit more information um, just about where the food is coming from and you know what kind of connection you can make with your neighbors because these are these are our neighbors you know they're they're small farms they're not you know giant corporations with you know 50 majillion cows and a teeny tiny little shed to keep them in these are farmers that treasure their crop and treasure their animals you know it's 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 been <laughs> It's been That's really eye-opening for me, you know. I'm not a rancher. I'm not right. a, I'm not, I guess I am a farmer. I do. I grow a lot of my own food. Um, right. But I don't grow meat. So having access to amazing beef like this, this is uh, JS2 cattle in Seminole. That's 90-10 beef. 
and it's beautiful. It makes the most amazing burgers. And then you can get bulk pork. You can buy an entire pig on our group. You can just join the group and buy a pig. That's actually, that's usually how it happens. Well, uh, right. Krista, my good friend, Krista said I joined and three hours later, I bought a whole cow. <laughs> <laughs> so we are, we are really, you know, we're helping the farmers. We're helping them get their product out there. We're helping reconnect Florida with its agricultural roots because that's where this state started. That's yeah, absolutely. That's where the state started. Um, and what about um, consumers? Do you, do you find that a lot of consumers maybe are looking for stuff that is out of season? Um, do you think there's a learning curve with yes. people trying yes. to figure out, you know, um, what, you know, uh, trying to buy, I guess, you know, mangoes in December. I know you haven't gone through December yet, but. You know, no, there were a lot of people climate. looking for strawberries in July. Right. Um, and that's rough. And I, I did make a couple of very vehement posts about, hey, you know, we don't have blueberries in September. You know, our, our seasons are short, but they are plentiful. You know, we have hundreds of blueberry farms in this state. And um, so it's, it's a little bit of a learning curve trying to say, OK, you know, you can't you can't get strawberries right now. They do have to come in from Tennessee. But when you buy those strawberries from Tennessee in your local Florida market, that market can then turn those dollars into buying power with the local farms around them. So when strawberry season does come in, they can spend more. So it's. Oh, OK. So some of your farmers are buying local but out of state produce and bringing it in. We do have, yes, we, there was a question about whether or not we were going to make our group 100% locally grown only. Uh -huh. And it's, it's not impossible to do that, but I think that's just a little bit too specialized for the average consumer. And I think that makes it a lot harder to have an availability. So I, I, what I wanted to do was have our members pledge to, you know, be more vocal at their farmers markets or at their uh, local shops or at their Publix and say, hey, where are the local goods? Right. You know, pledge to make that effort. And then also the responsibility lies with our small businesses. Yes, it might be easier to get those strawberries from Tennessee or the international imported goods it might be easier but if they take the money that they and the revenue that they make from those sales and they reinvest it into the state when season comes through uh, it it makes me feel a little bit better about it um and it also varies the amount of goods we have available so i have no problem you know interstate commerce is great and interstate trade is fantastic i would prefer that we didn't have as much imported goods but unfortunately you know that's not my decision <laughs> Sure. Um, I mean, they might even be building relationships with other farmers. Oh, absolutely. Who, I mean, like, you know, we just can't really grow garlic here in Florida that well. So, you know, if you were growing pineapples and mangoes here in Florida and met a garlic farmer up in North Carolina, and on the flip side, when we have way too many mangoes, you're supplying them with mangoes for their farmers markets because they're trying to do the same thing in their off season. Yes. You know, um, so, yeah, I could totally see a, a nice reciprocal relationship mm -hmm. um, where, you know, especially if you could have that truck full going both ways, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, that That's that's amazing. Um, and then you, you kind of touched on what I was saying about food distribution as a double edged sword, because that's what really spoiled people into thinking that you can get strawberries around. Mm -hmm. um here in florida and or blueberries anytime we want blueberries we go to the store and get them what a lot of people don't realize um i mean i think most people do realize that hey sometimes when i buy that fruit at the store it tastes really good and sometimes when i buy that fruit at the store it doesn't taste really good and what they don't seem to realize is what they're cluing into is buying stuff in season versus buying stuff out of season exactly. you know yes. bu buying stuff that traveled halfway around the world where it is in season now um or or traveling from someplace where it's grown in a different manner in a greenhouse or somewhere it just doesn't have the flavor um but i i do that too i when i go into Publix, it just if we go into Publix right now or uh during strawberry season mm -hmm. when is that march april, march, yep. march april february march april 
Actually, it could go all the way up through June if you're in Tallahassee, but. <laughs> but, if you go, but if you go into Publix, any strawberries you pick up during those months are from a farm in Florida. Yes. Like always. But in May, June, and July, in August, I challenge you to go into any store and find a local mango. Yeah. And that, that's like peak season here in Florida. Oh, yeah. Huge and there are farm. mango farms, and there are, I don't know what they do with them all. We're apparently a huge mango producer, uh, relatively speaking, for the United States. I don't know if they ship them all up to New York because they get more per, I have no idea. But you can't find, find me a store that carries one local banana. I mean, you know, for a fact, bananas grow like crazy here. Mm -hmm. So I, I haven't even ever seen bananas, local bananas sold at a farmer's market. Which is really weird, you know. Yeah. Um, pineapple, well, I mean, you know. I've never seen a local pineapple. I know. No, I've never seen a local pineapple. Well, as far as gardening goes, we all know we can grow them. We're part of all these groups where people, you know, are, are killing it on those three fruits: yes. mangoes, bananas, and pineapples. But um, this is really cool. This is really exciting. Um, by the way, did you get any flow of mangoes during mango season on your um, on your page? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I can absolutely yeah. tell. Because I share all the content, I can definitely tell when things are peaking and when they're starting to slow down. Um, mangoes were huge all over South Florida, uh, especially Miami-Dade, uh, Dania Beach, Redland, just huge. And uh, it was awesome to see some of the markets that I had come into contact with see similar posts in the group and then make the drive all the way down to Miami to go get those fruits and bring them back and then say, Hey, we have local fruit. You know, some of them did that way before I even came onto the market. So I can't take full credit for that, but I do see them, you know, saying, Hey, now we have local avocados. Now we have local this, now we have local that because they found an access for it. Um, we recently featured uh, Bracken's macadamia orchard in plant city. And oh, they're uh, great. Yeah. They're huge. They're great. Yeah. You know, and everybody's like, wait, you can grow macadamias here? Yeah. I'm like, yes, of course you can. You know, you can grow them all over Central Florida. And uh, it's, it's, I would love to see more of a market for those kind of specialty goods. And I'm hoping that that is what we are building towards is just getting the, the word out there that local fruit is amazing. So what's peaking right now? What's the big thing that people are asking for? What's the big thing the farmers are pushing? Are we in a dead spot? What's going on? It's kind of weird right now because a lot of people are putting their early starts in the ground. Mm -hmm. um, there are some cucumbers, there are some early mm -hmm. squash, early okay. peas, especially north. You can see a lot of peas. Um, but yeah, right now everybody's just starting to get right into opening. A lot of farmers markets are reopening this month. A lot of um, events um, and seasonal stuff, Halloween, fall festivals, harvest festivals, pumpkin patches, corn mazes, that sort of stuff is really starting to kick in. Um, I know uh, Long and Scott in Mount Dora just posted that they have cucumbers available by the crate. So, you know, crops are definitely just now starting to trickle in. It was a long, hot summer <laughs> full of mostly mangoes and avocados. <laughs> so okay. now that we have a little bit more availability. It's definitely gonna definitely gonna spice things up this fall in the group. Maybe, maybe we should try and reach out to some small farms up north um, and and dangle mangoes in front of their face and <laughs> get some get some get some of those northern apples down here. There you um, go. We'll treat mangoes for apples. <laughs> I remember when I when I went to Seattle. I'm sure this is what uh, you know when we make fun of northerners for coming here and they're like, oh my god, look oranges. I was like the exact same way. My wife and I were walking down the road and I was like, oh my God, that's, a, that's an apple tree. And there was like apples all over the ground. And I'm like, oh my God, there's like, there's apples on the ground. People just let this happen? <laughs> 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 this is totally I'm a Florida boy. So okay. um, that's really exciting. Um, the, you kind of touched on something that I definitely want you to mention. Is this going to also be a place for people to connect to um, agro-tourism. And why don't you explain to folks what agro-tourism is? And because I think we are coming 
into peak agritourism season. It's super exciting as soon as the weather gets nice. So yeah, yeah. As soon as the rain stops, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you know, fall in Florida is huge. I think even even though there's the specter of of doom a little bit kind of permeating, there are still a lot of places that are holding events because. Farms are lucky enough they are outdoors. They don't have the same restrictions for event spaces that indoor events do. So it's, you know, a fall festival would go really well right now. Uh, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of them. I'm actually putting together an event calendar for the website. So we will be able to um, kind of bring all that together, but that's that's in the works. That's, <laughs> I've got a lot going on right now. <laughs> so um, for everybody who doesn't know, agritourism is um, kind of a, an industry where farms have other uh, streams of revenue um, that they bring people onto the farm who, uh, so like uh, having weddings at farms, that would be a form of agritourism. Going to the corn maze, that's a form of agritourism. You pick, that's a form of agritourism. Anything where you're personally engaged on that farm, petting animals, uh, hay rides, um, uh, education, that's all under that umbrella of agritourism. Yep. And it is a really great idea for um, to get the family out, uh, to go see a farm, to spend some money directly with that farmer um, and get to know them, figure out where they are. Um, we've got all the fall festivals, Halloween, um, mm -hmm. and I believe they do them up through Christmas, some of them, you know. Oh, yeah. Fall. Yeah. Oh, and then, then, you know, right after Christmas, we go right into heavy fruit season. Strawberries start, you know, February, March-ish. So it's you pick season right up through June-ish in Central Florida and then even until, you know, early July in North Florida. But you also touched on education, um, you know, a lot of these farms, especially the smaller permaculture type uh, farms, are putting together classes on how to grow stuff because the surge of people looking to grow their own this year is really, it's, it's insane. There are so many people looking for more information about how to grow in Florida's climate because it's a little bit backwards if you're, you know, used to growing in Michigan. It's a little different down here. <laughs> so a lot, of, a lot of farms that, you know, never held educational classes before are saying, hey, come see how we do what we do. You know, they're opening up every aspect of their business. It's not just, hey, come pet, you know, a donkey and then pick some fruit and then leave. It's come and see what we do, who we are, how we do what we do, and then we will give you those skills to take home to your family. So they're-, so, they're Yeah, it's a truly immersive experience. Um, <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. It's, it, I'll tell you what, anybody who's watching, if you have not experienced uh, one of these event days or farm days, um, do do yourself a favor for you and your family and uh, go go check it out. And you said you're going to have these listed on the events page, and that's going to be on the, the website or the group yes. or both? Yes, we're putting together an events page for the website. There will be a calendar up, hopefully. Uh, we're looking towards the middle of October for that, so it's going to be like right around peak Halloween, fall festival season time. Um, and then uh, after the uh, calendar, we've also got holiday events and holiday vendors. Um, a lot of farmers who are a lot of farmers and small makers and crafters who were affected by all of the shutdowns and all of the uh, event cancellations early in this year are really struggling. So we are also putting together a holiday catalog okay, for okay. small businesses who are looking for a way to get their product out there because their event was canceled. So we're putting together a holiday catalog for any small business, preferably agricultural or food related. But if you make knives, if you make, you know, uh, handcrafted goods, those sorts of things, I would love to talk to you about putting you in the calendar or in the catalog, excuse me. Um, and we want to uh, help all of those people who maybe missed out on a huge spring season come back with, you know, come back with a oomph at the end of fall. You know, we're really, really trying to help as many people as we can, connecting farmers with customers, connecting farmers with farmers, connecting markets with farmers, just really trying to reconnect Florida with their agricultural roots. That's Jillian, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Do you want to, um, I'm going to type, do you, do you want to do an email or should they just message the uh, Facebook group or like, so do you have an email that you're using for this or? 
Right now, the best way probably to contact me would be the uh, the website, floridafarmfinder.com. I have the application for the holiday catalog on there. I've got various contact uh, fields. Um, we even set up a portal. If you know of a market or a shop or a farm stand or uh, a little old man who sells peanuts on the side of the road, if you know of those people and you want to put them in our group but they don't have Facebook, you can give me all of their details and I will build a listing for all of those people as well. Um, you just provide me as, with as much contact information as you can or as much detail as you can. Um, and I will be happy to build a listing for all of those as well. Um, but yeah, the website is definitely the best way to get a hold of me um, if you're not on Facebook. If you are on Facebook, I do accept private messages, um, but I'm, I'm getting a little, the inbox is a little full. So okay. I'm getting to them as quickly as I can. The website allows me to kind of uh, go through that a little bit easier. <laughs> And where's, so where's the future of this going? Are you going to um, become a nonprofit or? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, there are some questions about whether or not we would qualify as a nonprofit, but that would be a, an amazing goal. Yes. Okay. Um, we would like to uh, really be eligible for grants and stuff to expand our services and to find more farmers and make more connections out there. Um, so it would be, that would be fantastic, <laughs> but we're still in the very early stages right now. We're kind of just having fun and feeling our way through the fall season and seeing where that gets us. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just kind of, um, taking the blow in stride. That's great. Um, That's all I, can do. Uh, I mean, this is, this video is going to get shared. This video is really going to go out there. Um, well, I mean, like, do you need any help with um, with forming a nonprofit? If there's somebody who want, who knows about doing that, somebody who's got a you know background in business or law or something. Absolutely, absolutely. I will take I will take all of the help I can get. Um, I also need people who are interested in mining data for me because I'm putting together uh, a list of all of the farmers markets and um, their basically where you could sort by day so that you could be like, hey, it's Thursday, is there a farmer's market near me? And then go to my website and say, oh, look, there's a farmer's market. It's only 20 minutes away and it's open in three hours. Let's go, you know, to make that, um, I, I think a big disconnect there for farmer's markets is people are like, oh, it's tomorrow. Yeah, I guess I'll go. When it's really kind of, a, I'm kind of bored today. What do I want to do? That, right. That's usually how it works. They don't really plan for that. So if, if you have data mining skills and you'd like to help me put together a giant spreadsheet, I would love to have you. <laughs> um, but so honestly, anybody who's watching, if you're connected with uh, any um, groups or clubs in the university system, if you yourself are a professor or teacher, and you have any students that you think that this would be a good internship for them to maybe uh, earn some credits, do a thesis, uh, anything like that. Um, if you've watched the uh, show, if you just tuned in, go back and watch the rest of the show. This is an exciting uh, group and organization or potential organization that is uh, very much needed. And um, I really don't see the end of it. That's why I was asking you if you saw. No, I don't either. <laughs> because everybody eats. And I think that farmers being as busy as they are, um, there's always going to, it's always going to be a soft spot, which is why, like I said before, uh, evil food distributors can swoop in and save the day and yes. muck me up the waters because Maybe. that is, that is a, that is a soft spot. Um, and I, an organization like this that is um, acting as a free market, hands-off uh, distribution connection point, because um, the farmers are never going to have enough time. They're, never. They're, I think never. It's, it is such a uh, involved uh, labor of love that uh, I mean, I, I when I used to see when I did farmers markets every weekend, and I would see those farmers there every Saturday and Sunday, um, selling their produce, and then watching them on a slow day, um, packing up and taking ninety percent of what was out on the tables, and it didn't go back in coolers; it went in boxes that got thrown away. So basically, if if you've been farming all week and you go to a farmers market and you have a bad day. 
it's a really bad day. You don't it's just exactly like, you're already you're already exhausted. You really should have been spending that day with your family or having a day off. And um, these farmers markets are five to eight hours with probably a two to three hour uh, pack and setup in the morning and probably a two to three hour pack and setup. You got to figure farms are probably also driving 45 minutes to an hour to that farmer's market. So, I mean, I've done the math. They're probably looking at somewhere between a 10 and 14 hour day on top of their normal 10 and 14 hour days to not sell produce and the salt on the wound have to throw most of it away because it's sat outside all day. In so the I'm, not, I'm not trying to make people feel bad for not going to farmer's markets or fine. What I'm trying to say is that there is a huge place for some other form of getting the produce from the farmer into your hands, the consumer. Yes. Um, any other B2B, any other businesses, like have restaurants been poking around in there, any local restaurants or anything that are trying to get into this? I know a while back there was a bunch of restaurants that were trying to get into the local movement, and there was articles written about them because they just had it in their um, – in their information, they don't. They weren't really doing it. Right. I'm sure they were trying, you know. But well, um, I, I think uh, Florida Fresh Meat Company is probably my favorite example of that because I've seen Jan Costa drive all over the state, and he will tag every restaurant that he drops his products off at. So I, I think that the local goods specialized market is growing, and I think. Um, with all the recent changes, there's definitely more of a demand for it. So I, I, uh, the way I see it is that is only expanding. Um, but I don't necessarily want to add restaurants and that sort of thing into our, into our stuff yet. Um, I still want to, you know, stick with locals, makers, creators, growers, that sort of thing, ranchers, um, just to get the foundation in. And then once we've got, you know, once we've got a good setup there going, then maybe expand to that sort of thing. But of course, if you own a restaurant, if you own, you know, a, a, a boutique or something like that, and you're looking for new local goods, please, please come into my group and please search by county, uh, search by product, and you will find everything available to you locally. And, uh, you know, you're going to help out these farmers. They're going to be excited. You're going to be excited. Your customers are going to be excited because it's locally made, locally grown. It's, it's going to be good for everybody. I promise. Join the group, search for the goods. It's out there. I promise. You're going to almost, you're going to almost need like a group Sherpa one day. Someone who, <laughs> <laughs> someone who you contact and they kind of already know, know the ropes. Um, we're, I, we, we've gone over, which is really great because this has been an awesome uh, conversation. I want to just get into some of the questions. There really weren't too many. Um, so Lee Roden, yes, farm to table, absolutely. Scott Smith, can you talk a little bit about how to navigate your site? Sure. Best way to do it is the uh, search field, which depending on what device you have and what uh, browser you're using might be in a couple of different places. Um, searching the group is usually at the top right-hand corner. Look for a little micro uh, uh, magnifying glass and then type in your county or type in your uh, what, prefer, what product you're looking for. Um, also, there's a lot more information about where to find goods and other resources in our announcements tab. There's, I think, seven or eight posts right in there um, about where to go. Our hashtags are also there. So if you're looking for- You do have the hashtags milk, listed? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yep, they're in okay. the announcements. So if you're looking for goat milk or you're looking for cow milk or you're looking for raw milk or you're looking for- uh, we have a hashtag for beef, we have a hashtag for pork, we have a hashtag for chicken, we have a hashtag for elderberry, we have a hashtag for honey, uh, and you can just click on that little blue word and then scroll and see everything we have the whole state has to offer just for that item. Um, so that's helpful. And then uh, I was asking for help uh, with data earlier because the plan is to compile all of that information and shift it onto the website at some point because uh, we have so many posts right now dating all the way back to April and earlier um, that it's it's getting a little bit crowded. <laughs> so you might not narrow down as quickly. But I take I take requests. If you don't join the site and you're like, oh my God, I have no idea what I'm looking for. How do I find X? Please 
send me a message or use the contact form on the website and I will reach out to you and I will help you. I'm proud of it. And then um, Jennifer Cron, um, is there a list of what's in season for various times of the year for Florida? Yes, um, fresh from guess, Florida has that be. Mm -hmm. yep, they have a whole chart that you can um, do and they also uh, quarterly and monthly offer more information about what is available in season. Um, uh, just a quick scroll through the group will definitely show you what's out there. Uh, but uh, fresh from Florida is a great way to access that information. I'm going to try and find it really quick. They've got a Facebook page. They've got a website. They've got everything. <laughs> Let's see here. Is that right? Freshfromflorida.com? Or is it part of the... It's Florida probably part of, part of the state. state. Nope, that's not it. All right. Well, if I find it, I'll put it in the comments later, awesome. everybody. It'll be down there in the comments. Um, I'll dig it around. If I remember correctly, it's like an offshoot of the Florida Department of Agriculture Consumer Services uh, yes. site. It's not just freshfromflorida.com. Um, Jennifer, I will go ahead and look that up. Anybody else who's watching, again, it will be in the comments uh, down below. Um, Jillian, thank you so much. This has been great. Um, Absolutely. It's, it's really exciting uh, what you're doing and so needed. It is just I can't believe no one's done this yet. Maybe I, I just. You just I, I think the difference. There's a lot of groups on Facebook, but I don't think there's anything quite like ours. You know, uh -huh. a lot of a lot where we we remove a lot of the uh, the trouble for the farmer and uh, some of the other groups. You message somebody and they're like, "Okay, PM me for a price." But I will definitely take the extra step and you know put all that information in the post when I share it. So that's it's it's a little bit more cohesive, I guess, than just scrolling through a, you know, county Facebook farmer site or group. Um, and uh, that's, what we're, that's what we're trying to go for, is just getting everybody reconnected. Oh, before we, before we hop off, um, sure. I did want to ask if, if, did you, do you feel like you're having to train a little bit some of these farmers as far as, um, like, are they used to this? Do they already know what they're doing? Or no, no. no. <laughs> oh, well, actually, no, that's not true. Some of them are amazing. Some of them okay. are, are pros, you know, great pictures, great content, hashtags. They include their city and county, so they show up in all of the local algorithms that Facebook has. Um, some of them are great. Some of them have great grandkids that do it. Um, and some of them, maybe not so much. So I do take the time when I can to guide some of the Facebook newbies um, into the best practices for selling their goods and how to uh, make the best connections when they're, they're reaching out to their customer base. So um, if you do want to post your farm on my site, the best way to do that is to go into your business page, take five minutes to think about what you offer throughout the entire year, and then put that together in a post, reintroduce yourself to your customers, share that post into my group with your city and county in the caption. And uh, that makes the most impact because our content is searchable 24 seven, 365. Somebody who might be looking for stuff in Dade County in April might not be looking for mangoes, but they may look for it later in the year and they'll be like, oh, okay, so in April I can go to them for this and then in September I can go to them for that. So uh, that's the best way to get your name out there on my group. You don't have to wait for me to post you. <laughs> Please don't wait for me. Fill the group with as much content as we can. As long as it's food or farm related, I would love to have you. Okay, so you have to kind of go in on some of them. I was laughing earlier because if any of them are watching this later on, don't know who they are. No. <laughs> no, I am way too nice. I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna point anybody like, oh, out. And they're always you no. Know, they're always so grateful for the help. And I am. Okay. I'm, you know, I just want them to improve. So um, everybody benefits. <laughs> That's great. So basically, go clean up your Facebook page. Get all your correct information on there, and then post to their own business Facebook page. Yes, and reintroduce then, yourself to your customers, exactly. And then share that post into the group. Into my group, yes. As opposed to just posting into the group. 
right? right? Because okay. when you post as yourself, you don't have a chain to fall back to. People are going to message you directly and they're going to say, where are you located? How much? Um, when all of that information could already be on your Facebook page. So it saves you time. You know, you don't have to answer all of those questions about the who, what, where, when, and why, because all of that information is already in your about page or your shop tab, or they can click through to your website. So the best way to do that is to put post on your business page and then share that post from your business page into my group. It, it'll save you a whole bunch of time, a whole bunch of headaches. Uh, for joining me and for telling everybody about this great group and i really wish you all the best you know i'm right there with you on this so anything i can do to, to keep keep this moving um Appreciate let me it. know absolutely um, if if i miss it and you have some important stuff to share out of um your groups or page onto mine um just always let me know Okay. Sure, yeah. No, check out the website. Check out the group. We've got stickers. I've got uh, t-shirts. Oh, show us the merch. You got merch. Oh, coming. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I don't, unfortunately, my shirts aren't ready, but uh, they're coming. I just uh, just put the last payment down on shirts today. So they are coming in, uh, I think the 27th is my ship date for shirts. But I also have decals. Nice. <laughs> and you guys can definitely purchase those on the website. I've got like 150 left. So please, you know, grab a sticker and show your support for Florida small farms. Wasn't there something too, um, or are you full on people taking out ads for the, for the I do have, catalog? We do have sponsorships available for the website. Yep. All of that okay. information is in our shop tab. So if you're interested in sponsoring the website and putting some ads up there, I would love to talk to you about that. Okay, great. All right, Jillian, thank you so much. Um, if there's anything else that you think of, you know, you can just go back to this video and put it in the comments section. I um, totally. And then uh, that kind of brings me to this point. If you have anything you want to put in, also don't forget to put it on the YouTube channel because this is being simulcast right now on to YouTube. So everybody, if you uh, cannot join me um, on Wednesday live at 530 for my weekly garden report and question and answer topic slash interview. Um, you are always welcome to send me an email at info at whitlongorganics.com with your questions or your topic suggestions. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, we are also simulcasting on Facebook. If you're watching this on Facebook, we are uh, simulcasting on YouTube. So just get over there and uh, you can watch it on either one, whichever more convenient for you. Well, thanks, Jillian. And um, I look forward to seeing what great things this uh, turns into. Oh, man, I'm so excited. Thank you so much for having me, David. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye.